Good morning, everyone. It's rolling up here on 730, so I think we should get started. My name is Laura Bolt. I work for Mr. Swaley over at Make Safe Tools. We're really glad to see you all here this morning. Today, we're sponsored by Make Safe Tools, which is the company I work for, um, and also ASSP. We are so glad to see you all here this morning um, for the San Diego chapter of ASSP. Today, our speaker is going to be Mr. Scott Swaley. He is the founder and president of Make Safe Tools. And today, he's going to be the main speaker for this webinar. He is an accomplished carpenter, machinist, hobbier, programmer, and engineer, practicing engineer. He's been featured in a number of documentary films. He holds some patents. And um, of course, like the rest of us, he is a big dog person with his lovely greyhounds. He has over a decade of experience with electrical design for hospitals, data centers, and renewable energy systems, and is also an active participant in the regulatory processes with NFPA, OSHPD, NRTLs, and Cal OSHA, which is why we are here today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to him and we can get started. Thank you all for joining us. I look forward to answering your questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, we are going to get rolling. Thank you for all the everyone from ASSP that has joined as well as um, the rest of our attendees. We're already up at 54, so that's great for an early morning webinar. So starting off, um, why are we talking about this? And I think this is kind of an important place to start. So I'm going to start with what, why I'm passionate about this particular topic. And, and there's two kind of real reasons. One is something that we, we hear a fair amount that, you know, injuries happen a lot. But I, I've spent um, weeks and weeks digging through the data of how injuries happen, when injuries happen, reading incident reports. And the, a few things that jump out at me are, are one, that there's about 40,000 people a year that suffer from traumatic machine-related injuries, right? If we really kind of target down um, for that one injury type. And it's been the same year after year after year. And when I started seeing that, I started asking questions and wondering, okay, well, you know, why is that the case? And then of course we see when uh, OSHA releases their most common citations reports, um, which they've doing, been doing, I believe since 2002, every single year, machine guarding is on it. And so um, early on when I, when I came into this industry, that, that frustrated me a lot because I, I would see that, okay, there is no change in injury rates. And when it gets to the actual like thing that we know will prevent these injuries, people still aren't doing them. Um, and so I've transitioned that frustration <laughs> over the years into um, really trying to get down to, to why that is. And one of the reasons I found is that kind of the simple answer is that machine guarding is really hard um, and doing it right is even harder. And so what, what uh, my company is about and what this webinar is about is about making a few just real simple, actionable things we can um, pull out of that. And you'll, you'll see kind of how this petition ties into that. And then secondly, we, we, we like to, you know, think on a day-to-day -day basis that like our intent is enough and that, um, you know, sometimes it feels like those details don't matter. But then there's sometimes that they really do. And I'm going to do a little thought experiment with, with us for a second before we roll into it. So imagine for a minute that let's say we have a loved one, a parent that's in, um, that's older, taking some new medications. You talk to your doctor and let's say it's your, um, your mother and she's being helped with a prescription drug to help heart disease, right? And let's say a few weeks into that process, there are some side effects you didn't expect. And in talking to a doctor, you find out that, oh, well, that medication that was prescribed actually isn't for heart disease. They just kind of, it's something that's for another disease, but they thought it might work for that. So they wanted to try it. Uh, and so if you imagine that, that might be a little frustrating, right? As a kind of consumer, you're expecting that between the FDA and a doctor that they're making informed choices about your health. But let's take it one step further and say, what if you then found out that that medication was you know, approved for another purpose, not only isn't for heart disease, but on the label says, not for people over 50 and not for use with heart disease. 
So imagine that for a sec, that something that cons what was about your health and the health of a loved one was specifically not allowed to be used for that, but that a regulating agency and maybe a doctor had prescribed it. And so that would be really frustrating. And what we're gonna find out as we go through this webinar is that in the safety industry, there are things like that happening right now, where even a very well-intentioned and informed um, safety professional can make what seem like very reasonable choices and actually end up um, with devices that fail and cause other hazards. So we're gonna be digging into that as part of the petition. So hopefully that connects and um, we'll move forward. So uh, we also talked, um, we're, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different topics, but funneling it down to one. So I mentioned earlier that one of my frustrations is that machine guarding is just so nebulous and large. So we will kind of tangentially mention a lot of different things. We'll talk a little bit about ANSI, a little bit about hazardous energy control, a little bit about state versus fed OSHA. But in the end, the thing that we're really gonna focus on today is one part of accidental restarts because it's actionable, it's inexpensive, and it's something that we can all do quite literally today in our facilities. And for people that are from out of state, know that even though we're talking about a California petition today, all of these concepts um, apply federally. And then, um, as I mentioned, we're also gonna be looking specifically at kind of electrical and electrical motor type things. So obviously hazardous energy and things like that also include pneumatics and um, gravitational hydraulic, lots of other energies. We're not gonna be focusing on those today. So what is this petition, right? Petition 580. Uh, I'd be curious to hear if anyone um, read the petition in advance. Uh, so if you did, please do kind of chat. I'd love to, um, I'd love to hear kind of what you've learned so far. But the basic part, of, um, there's two parts of petition 580. One is that to clarify existing regulation for preventing the unintentional restart of machinery. And I say clarify existing because these rules already apply federally and they um, already apply in California. The problem is these standards are buried in an area nobody would look. In this specific example, you have a section of um, machine guarding in Title VIII in Cal, uh, for Cal, Cal OSHA, and it has everything you would expect to find in a machine guarding section. Then separately, way over in the electrical section, where an electrician might be looking for doing an installation, they have some kind of subtle language about um, the unintentional restart of machinery. Now, as a safety professional, I'm not gonna probably be reading all of Title VIII cover to cover. I'm gonna go through the part that I think is relevant to what I'm doing, which would be machine guarding. And it is not mentioned in there at all. So this petition seeks to remedy that so people are aware of what really is already a regulation, but it's so easy to miss. And then secondly, is really diving into those um, approved but hazardous safety devices that are currently on the market, kind of with that metaphor I, I used a little bit ago. So um, as we dive in, a few just things to know. One, when we say NRTL, an NRTL is a nationally recognized test lab, like UL, Underwriters Laboratory, there's a lot like them. Um, and all equipment that basically plugs into the wall in a workplace is required to be approved by a nationally recognized test lab for that particular use. That's Fed OSHA, that's Cal OSHA, that's all of them. So something to keep in mind. And then also that um, OSHA is actually the regulating body of nationally recognized test labs. So that's a part that a lot of people don't know. OSHA is the one that is inspecting and kind of quote unquote certifying that the uh, nationally recognized test labs are doing what they do. That's kind of why this all ties together. Um, and we'll get into that as we go through. So we're gonna start broad, right? With kind of the world of unexpected startups, like I mentioned, and we're gonna focus down. So starting broad, we wanna say, what do we mean unexpected startups, right? Like, what does that mean? So starting with, you think about a piece of machinery that is starting up in a time that um, A is unexpected and also B is likely to cause some kind of energy or even just to prevent a, present a hazard. So 
there's obvious kind of conditions on when a machine restarting would be hazardous, like somebody has their arm in a machine doing maintenance, or um, someone is, let's say, grabbing a work piece or is very close to the um, point of operation. But there's also some more uh, kind of subtle things. For example, that if a piece of debris or a work piece or a jacket is sitting on a machine when it starts, um, if anyone's ever seen that on a table saw, it basically turns into a catapult. Um, and so thinking about like all these kind of bad things that can happen um, when things restart. And I, I remember the time uh, at airports before there was alarms for the baggage carousels. I remember as a kid, very specifically, that I was playing basically on the carousel when it started and it scared me to death. And I remember I had my sweater around my waist and one of the drawstrings got caught between the two little slats. Only happened for about half a second. It pulled out right away, I was fine, but it scared me to death. And of course now they have big alarms and lights that go off before that carousel starts moving because it's such an obvious hazard. But when we think about most of our equipment, um, it actually, there are a lot of ways it can restart itself. And going over to the left there on the causes, one is just straight up, you accidentally press a button or you have an unprotected foot switch, right? The actual person using the machine makes a mistake and turns it on by accident or they um, reset it when they would not expect it to restart. One good example is that in an emergency stop situation, one of the ANSI requirements is that when you reset an emergency stop, that a separate and intentional action is required to um, to start the machine after a reset. So um, as we're going through that, the um, another way is that in the um, there's kind of the someone else is turning the machine on, whether you know uh, whether they're aware of the person in that room or not. And so when we when we think about that, that's often someone in a breaker room, right? Something that will, for example, um, let's say you trip a circuit breaker and the person in the, um, in the breaker room will go ahead and flip that breaker on not knowing that someone downstream is using a machine. Um, other kinds of things that would make a machine start up are um, if there is a, a thermal protection device that resets automatically. For example, a lot of lower end motors have a thermal device in them that is very similar to um, that thing you stick in your turkey. You know, it's Thanksgiving time, you got that little thermal device that pops out at a certain temperature. Um, a lot of lower end motors will have a device like that, but unlike your turkey, when the temperature then drops, that will reset, right? And in the event that you have not planned for that in your machine guarding, power would be restored to the motor. And so this is just one of those many things that um, can come up and, and be a problem. So I see something from the, pen, the chat, so Doug is saying that he would actually disagree with the manual reset of emergency stop because um, emergency stop function only permits restarting. It doesn't cause a restart. So um, to Doug's question, absolutely true. Um, and what I'm trying to show by this slide is that there's just this world of ways the machine can restart. But if you designed machine guarding right, it won't, which we're going to get into in just a sec. So Doug, I think we're on the same page and I'll get there in, in just a moment. Um, so uh, the other thing that we're going to be talking about specifically today is uh, when we're thinking about restarting after a loss of power. So that basically means imagine you've got your machine, it is in the on position, and you lose power for some reason. When power is restored, that is still in the on position, and it will start. Now you would assume that most tools would be designed to not do that, when in fact, um, almost all of them are. So. Um, we're going to be diving into a little bit of what um, Doug mentioned now. And here we go. Oh, oh excuse me. Almost there. So um, also, when we're talking about machinery, we do literally mean all machinery. And so, again, we're talking specifically about electrical today um, and specifically about motors, which is a, a subset of the, the kinds of restart. Um, but we can obviously think about power tools and machine tools, um, but also conveyors, rollers, mixing equipment, really anything that has an electric motor. Um, and so that really kind of expands this 
um, scope tremendously. You think about like, this is everything that has a motor. Like that is, um, and there is clarification in, in the regulation that says if the restart is likely to cause a hazard or if the restart could be hazardous. And so when we're thinking about this and you look at that mixer, for example, in the, in the center of the frame, I would argue that no matter what, that starting unexpectedly would be hazardous. Now, if you have a fully enclosed device that uses a motor and there's no way for someone to get in there and get hurt, you could very reasonably argue and hopefully document with a risk assessment that there isn't a hazard from that restarting, in which case this wouldn't be required. But as you know, um, you really have to be able to put your foot down and document that you've, you've done that thinking. So now diving into um, what Doug was mentioning. So I talked about all those different ways a machine could restart, right? So all the ways that it might. Now, there are lots of regulations that control most of those. And the, the thing that gets hard for people is that they all overlap and those overlaps aren't always obvious. So on the right here, in this kind of green area, and let me see if I can uh, highlight this for us really quick. Hopefully you guys can see this little um, laser pointer. So this green area over here is when you're doing some kind of intentional maintenance, right? You're servicing a machine, this is your lockout tagout territory, right? So um, a huge part of the hazardous energy control, right, is making sure that hazardous energy, like a restart, doesn't happen when you are disposed, when you have bypassed guards, or when you're maintaining equipment. So hazardous energy control and these various standards govern and protect people here, right? So this is all lockout tagout territory. We're not diving into that today, but that is where that should be. On the other hand, as Doug was mentioning, is normal machine guarding requirements. This is where things exist like, um, when you reset an e-stop, the machine should not restart without an intentional and deliberate action, right? So if you're um, following existing machine guarding regulations, that's already covered, right? And again, that can be a whole webinar in and of itself. So Doug, I hope that kind of gets to your question. Then there's this middle area. So this middle area is a little bit of what we're talking about today. So there's um, intentional production, there's intentional maintenance, there's also this strange little minor servicing exception that is its own webinar that we could talk about at another time. Um, but in these unplanned things, right, the Murphy's Law, when things are happening that we didn't plan for, whether it's straight up human error, whether it's a um, defect in a material that you hit, there's a nail you didn't expect in a piece of raw material, or that there is a, um, an under voltage event from the utility, all these different things. Um, and this is where we're gonna focus. So in these, some of these are pretty clearly covered by machine guarding. Some of them should theoretically be installed by the people um, physically installing um, electrical infrastructure. Because you can see when we get into this kind of under voltage um, loss of power stuff, which is our focus today, yes, it's under machine guarding, but it's often overlooked. It is regulated by nationally recognized test labs where they regulate the equipment you would use. And the um, different electrical codes also require that to happen. Problem is, as I was mentioned earlier with the um, with how uh, Kalosh is currently written, is all these things are not mentioned in the machine guarding standards. They're mentioned in the electrical standards, and that um, for me makes it very unclear because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, safety professional is going to read the machine guarding sections. Um, they're not going to be digging through um, all of that, and so. Um, Risk control in the um, chat asked a question. They said, where would removing a jam be in this schematic? So in this schematic, right, which is um, one of our creations, um, removing a jam, this is where it gets gray. S um, some would argue that that would be if a jam was, quote, routine, repetitive, and integral to your process, 
someone could argue that that's part of your minor servicing exception in normal production, in which case your machine guarding would theoretically protect you. However, if you, um, if you had to bypass a guard to do this, a case could be made that that is then service and maintenance, in which case you need to do lockout and tag out. So that, it gets very gray. Um, and uh, Doug is offering right now in the chat that um, the over and under voltage requirements are in the NFPA 79. Yeah, so if you look on the bottom here in electrical fire and safety, we do call out NFPA 79 is a part of that. Um, definitely used by control systems engineers. And where we're gonna be kind of living today is in the area where um, if you have a large control system that was intentionally designed by a control systems company, all the things we're talking about are things you know. What, what we'll be focusing on today is the things where you're using equipment that doesn't have that. And you're, you're in this spot where you might have a piece of equipment that turns on and off, like so many of us do. When I walk into a facility, there is the large equipment with industrial controls, and we'll be talking through all those things. But then there's also the little bandsaw in the corner and the conveyor that only gets used at Christmas and all these other things that don't have large elaborate controls. And so what we'll be talking about today is not the perfect thing that we'll, could cover everything, but some low hanging fruit you could do that will um, help out and could prevent injuries. So um, as I mentioned, we're really kind of focusing down to these like after loss and restoration of power events, right? This is not the catch-all of all machine guarding. Um, it's specifically focusing on how, um, when there's a loss of and then restoration of power, like in a circuit breaker trip or a brownout, that we machines don't restart. And you'll hear this referred to as a lot of different things. One is safe start, right? Some people brand that um, and they will use that to refer to this. Um, you'll call it accidental restart prevention protection. My favorite is anti-automatic restart protection, which I don't even know what that means. Um, and then also uh, low voltage dropout. So low voltage dropout is a similar thing, but it's sometimes used as a catch-all. And then lastly, magnetic switches. Someone will sometimes say a safety switch or a magnetic switch when they're referring to um, unexpected restarts. So the question is, how do you know if you need this, right? And so we're gonna start with just um, a, a simple test you can do after the call today. So again, this is only checking for the, the one kind of like subcategory of restart we're talking about, right? We're talking about low hanging fruit, not the perfect solution for everything. But in this kind of, for if you have a piece of motor driven machinery, whether it's a conveyor or a press or a bandsaw or a mixer, if it's starting unexpectedly, could injure someone, then you should go through these three steps. So you would go in, obviously you would clear the space, make sure that people are aware that you're running a test so no one's um, gonna get hurt. You will literally just turn your machine on, let it come up to speed, let it do what it does. While it is still in the on position, you will remove power. Now, th there needs to be a way for you to safely do this, of course. Now you can unplug it um, or you can turn it off at a local disconnect right? This isn't something you would want to do every day, right? But for this test, it's reasonable. So while that machine is on and running and unloaded, um, you would unplug it or turn it off at a disconnect, count to about two, plug it back in. See if that machine restarts. Okay, so literally that should take 10 seconds. And when you plug it back in or restore power, if that machine turns back on, you do not have restart protection. And so that's a very easy test you can do that will give you just a, a high level like, oh, I guess that would be kind of bad, right? And so um, when you're kind of thinking about what machinery to do this on, there are a few quick uh, reminders and some misconceptions that I, that I often see. One is that um, inexpensive tools have inexpensive hazards. So people assume that there's this relationship between the cost of a piece of machinery and how dangerous it is. And so if you have a large CNC system that you can climb into, people are very aware of how hazardous that could be. And 
a lot of time and intention and money is put into elaborate control systems to protect people. But then someone says, oh, here's a um, chop saw that we got for $90 at Harbor Freight that has no protection at all, but because it's inexpensive, we think that is somehow less of a risk. And so I would argue that if anything, that's backwards. Um, and so to really be thinking about when we say machinery, all machinery, because the, um, the amputation caused by a $90 saw is the same as an amputation caused by a $10 million CNC machine. So really thinking about like what those machines are and then also not expecting that a new machine complies. It is not the manufacturer of a machine's responsibility to meet OSHA regulations. That is not their job legally. It is the job of the employer. And so when you're, um, you buy a piece of equipment, it may have some of these features, it may not, depends on the manufacturer. Um, for example, if you're buying something like a standard piece of woodworking or metalworking equipment, there is kind of an imaginary line around uh, between $1,000 and $2,000. Above that, and they tend to include magnetic, magnetic switches, under that, and they tend not to, right? Again, rule of thumb, but you will see these kind of like bifurcations where sometimes their um, people, uh, these machines are safe, sometimes they're not. And the even more terrible part is the magnetic switches themselves um, are made by the exact same manufacturer as the non-magnetic switches. A, co a Chinese company called Kedu that makes almost every um, power tool switch used um, commercially. And so when, when we're thinking about that, they look identical. And unless you do this test or you take it apart and look at model numbers, you don't know. So really thinking all machinery here. So, um, uh, and then last note before we move on from this, is um, while you're doing this, right, all we're checking is rest, uh, restart after restoration of power for an electric motor. And though we're not focusing on it, it's a good time to also be looking for other kinds of hazardous energies, right? When you're looking at this machine, if there is another um, kind of motive force, assume there's something else there. So if you see a air hose going to it, assume that there could be some kind of pneumatic energy driven hazard. If there are hydraulics going to it, if there is something heavy being sustained at a height, assume that, oh, gravity could pull that back down, right? So just keep an eye out when you do these kind of things um, for other hazards. And that when you see something like that is your right away, like, oop, this is something I should actually do a full risk assessment on, right? We should always do a full risk assessment, but I know in reality that doesn't always happen. But when you start seeing those complications, that's where this little one, two, three is no longer, <laughs> no longer your, your, your guiding star. Um, so we've now, let's say, evaluated, oh, I need, um, I have machines that don't meet this requirement. I should go ahead and um, buy some equipment to make this better. So now we're going to dive into um, a specific customer story. So, um, and this kind of started my um, passionate journey down this road. So I have a customer that's an aerospace parts manufacturer and they have um, grinders at every CNC operator station and they use them for tool sharpening. Um, and I was surprised that they're still probably using like high speed steel instead of carbide for, for those, but whatever, right? So they have about 70 stations. So they have about 70 grinders. These are little guys, little like half horse, three quarter horse grinders. And they realized that they needed some anti-restart protection. So they did a, everything reasonably. They Googled it, they went, they found something that looked like it would work, they bought it, they installed them, and it was great. Now they did something that um, really helped them here. So they, as part of their policy, regularly test all safety equipment. So think about that. That, that is something that you could very easily argue as part of regulation, right? You should always evaluate your, uh, the performance of your safety equipment after mitigation, and then at some regular interval anything from a monthly test to a every shift test, depending on the, the mitigation. Um, but they did this monthly. And what they found is that for their 70 brand new anti-restart devices, every single month between one and three would fail. So just to kind of visualize that, what that looks like, I'm gonna do a little animation on the screen. So every month, the 
restart prevention was failing the brand new ones on all these machines. Now, one of the things about, um, this is true for most restart products, is they fail silently. Some, they can combust and you know, kind of fail gloriously, but often they will fail without any kind of alarm. You won't even know. And so um, this customer was smart enough that they're testing them regularly and so they found this. And this, this blew my mind. It's like, how could something be on the market that has a fail rate that a year after it's installed, this many devices are now hazardous again? That blew my mind. Um, and so I uh, started digging into it. And like any good engineer, I took one apart. And so you'll see, I, I, I try to specifically not call, call out any manufacturers here because I, I want you guys to be able to do your own kind of informed research. And I don't just want to go down that road. Um, but know that if you can recognize it, this is one of many, this is not the only one. So when, um, when we're going through and um, taking this apart, one of the things that su surprised me was I, um, it had a very small relay in it, right? And the relay is this little black box. And this little black box is the, the main switching component, right? And um, if you're sizing something for switching a motor and you have some electrical familiarity, there might be a few things you look for. One might be, is this switching device approved by a nationally recognized test lab? And in this particular case, the device itself is listed by, a, a, by UL and the switching device inside it is listed by UL, um, CSA and TUV, right? Okay. So it is a listed product, which means that it has been reviewed for um, electrical and fire safety by a nationally recognized test lab. Next thing you might say, is it have the correct voltage rating? And I'm using this example of a little grinder over here, right? So this particular relay, we're reading the top of it, is rated for 125 volts. Oh, look, our grinder is 125 volts. That should work, right? Seems fine. And we see, oh, our grinder only uses eight amps oh, this thing's rated for 15 amps, we should have plenty of margin, right? So if you are um, a very well-intentioned um, safety professional, you'd be looking probably not at the actual relay inside, but at the product specs, and you would say a 15 amp rated, right? This should work for my grinder. Um, and so this is where it gets a little weird. We obviously know that these were failing already at a huge rate. And so we have to understand a little bit about electrically what's happening. So does anyone remember doing that experiment in uh, when you were younger with the nail and the battery, like on the right there, make a little electromagnet? So um, motors are basically just big electromagnets, right? They're, they're, they're what's called an inductive load. Um, induction being a way that you can kind of store energy in a magnetic field. Now, um, anyone also remember when you were making this little thing when you were in fifth grade, what happened when you connected and disconnected it? You may remember there's little tiny little sparks. And that is stored energy being stored in a magnetic field trying to discharge itself. And so when you're switching motors, specifically motors, they are a notoriously um, difficult load to switch because any actual switch, right? Just like shown on the left here, is two pieces of metal that touch each other, right? That's what a, most switches are when you get back to their most basic point. But a motor, every time you disconnect it, does this. So you see that welding arc flash? A reasonably loaded motor will do that every time you disconnect it. And so you can imagine that that would be a very destructive thing for switches. And so you have to have switching devices or relays that are made for motor use. And this is why this thing fails. Because that tiny little relay, that's not rated for motors. And we're going to kind of pause here and be like, wait, 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 wait. I thought this thing was approved by UL. It is. But it's approved as a quote unquote appliance control. And so if you look at the actual UL standard that this thing is approved under, UL 246A, it covers things like household appliances, lights, audio video equipment, 
not intended for controlling motor operated appliances. So this is not only not meant for industrial, it's not even meant for your blender. Yet, their marketing material is right next to big pictures of table saws and drill presses and mills and um, it's, it would be very easy for someone to fall into that trap. Versus, for example, UL 508, which is one of the industrial control equipment standards, which historically, it's changing a little bit now, um, it's, um, it's specifically designed for the control of motors in an industrial environment. So just as a quick comparison, these two relays shown here are to scale and have kind of similar ratings, right? So those would both be good for a up to a 15 amp motor. The one on the left is obviously tiny and not made to handle those arcs and sparks we showed where the one on the right is. And it can handle that um, because it's been tested to a much, much higher standard. So again, it's one of those things where like you, you wouldn't know unless you were crazy like me and dig through standards all day. Um, and so the, the way though, the, the kind of lesson from this is when you're looking for things, when you're um, shopping for products, whether it's an industrial motor control or a um, emergency stop switch to really look to see, is it recognized by a test lab or is it listed by a test lab? And is it listed for that purpose? So that's, that's a big, big distinction, right? So is it listed for that purpose? Now, Doug mentions that this G7L um, relay is, is, has a lot of features built into it as part of that motor requirement, which makes it able to extinguish those arcs. Um, and part of it is that it actually has a double contact. So instead of like one piece of metal separating, there's two, so it shares the load. Also has, um, um, different ways that that arc can travel that make it like basically go away from the contacts faster. Lots of things and that are built into this, not too different from a circuit breaker, um, that make it uh, safer for motors. And the way to know that I, um, oh, apparently don't have that slide up here, is that uh, it'll actually say HP, horsepower rating on it, right? It'll say, this is rated for a one horsepower um, load. So. Okay, so now, so what should you do, right? So you're in this space, you wanna do accidental restart, um, but you don't know what to buy. So I'm gonna give kind of a, um, here's a kind of rough graph of what some of your options are. So we have some things down here that um, I've talked about that I wouldn't recommend for the reasons we just discussed, but there is still a very inexpensive option. If you have a straightforward piece of equipment and you have the capacity and the expertise to do it, some simple wiring just to replace a switch, a $20 switch that is UL 508 recognized can be installed in a piece of machinery. So that's one of those things that this does not have to be expensive. Now, and, and these kinds of real things, I mean, you can buy that on Amazon. Um, they are designed for that purpose. You buy a $5,000 jet bandsaw, it has that exact switch in it. Um, and so these are things that you can do that are inexpensive, that there's no reason not to do on like all tools and machinery in your facility. Now, um, as you kind of move up the road, right, you get things that have um, anti-restart that um, are kind of in line. There are some um, places that, uh, a momentary foot switch can be considered um, both anti-restart and sometimes as kind of an e-stop replacement. OSHA has some code clarifications where they talk about specifically um, uh, pipe threaders and how having a, because it's sometimes hard to do controls because they're directional and it can get a little more complicated. They've allowed uh, things like a momentary foot switch to be considered as a way to disconnect and things like that. So could apply to you. There's also these kind of UL 508A control boxes. They're kind of the Lincoln Log Lego version of a, um, a way to get um, anti-restart that we talked about and e-stop, right? We haven't talked about e-stop a lot. Depending on interpretation, it can be required or not required, but it, it is something that I would argue is good to have um, everywhere. And then, 
for, um, and these are available from every manufacturer you can imagine. You go to on a, uh, a Stronghold, a Gardamation, uh, um, a Rockford Systems, they all sell their own flavor of this, right? Not super expensive. Um, and that, as I mentioned, would be Anna Restart and Estop. You have products like ours, right? And so ours uh, is also in that kind of plug and play category, right? You just plug it in. And then for ours, you would get the Anna Restart, the Estop. You also get motor braking, which is kind of new, right? Um, I'll plug that a little later. Uh, and then, of course, you can build a custom control cabinet. And you can make that do anything you want. Uh, sky's the limit. And so there's this kind of huge spectrum. And as you're shopping, you want to be looking for, is it listed by a recognized, or is it listed by a nationally recognized test lab, right, for that purpose? You also, of course, want to check is, are the voltage and current and horsepower requirements, what you need. And then you say, is it something that we have the expertise to install ourselves? We're willing to rewire something. Okay, you can put in a magnetic switch, right? It's super inexpensive. You'd rather have something that's plug and play. You just plug it in, right? You're back up in this territory um, in the um, kind of with these control boxes or one of our products. Or you have other needs. And this is where... Um, when you have those other kinds of energy we were talking about, right? Maybe you have something pneumatic. There's uh, more complication than it's a simple kind of on-off piece of machinery. You really start wanting to get into these um, custom control cabinets, which on their own, if you're doing everything above board, means that you would likely hire someone. They will use all um, test lab recognized components and they will um, install them and arrange them in a um, agreed on way by the test labs and then that um, what's called a, um, a panel shop um, actually has approval from test labs it's called UL 508A to basically say hey we took all these recognized parts installed them in agreed on way and we put a sticker on it saying that this whole thing this whole um, control cabinet is now itself a listed assembly right we could go into the test labs at another time um, but uh, as with all safety things, as for anything on here, once you install it, you test it, right? That's huge. So once you, um, once you actually say, these are our requirements for what this controls have to do, you install it and then you go down that list and say, does it do, um, does it reset automatically? Does it start the machine when we re reset the e-stop? It better not, right? test it and see people make mistakes um i i was helping with a um an, an injury study recently where it was a large press break and um what they found or what we suspect happened based on the information is that there was a, a strange race condition um meaning that like uh two outcomes are possible where if someone was depressing a pedal when they pressed the safety switch there was a um, kind of it was it was a, a game of chance on whether the safety switch would work or not and that um, you know was an oversight by an engineer at some point we're all imperfect and so that's why you really want to be testing those things so I see a question in the chat about how would you know if a product is UL 508 that's a great question so um, you would know because literally on the product there will be a mark for UL it would be a, a little UL with a circle if it is a listed product, it means it's like a, a full assembly that is safe to install. If it was um, CSA, it would be the little CSA with kind of the half thing. That, um, I have some links uh, back in the presentation, which we'll share, that has all the different marks. Um, and right next to that, it should, um, it'll have one of two things. If it's a listed product, it will actually say the standard that it's listed under it. And it'll normally have um, the number and um, the description and then secondly um, it will also have a license number uh, or their kind of certification number and that's all public so part of this i learn right so i see a product and i say that's interesting and i just look up that number and on the uh, ul website you can see all these particular products are listed for these um, particular uses and, and it gives you all the information you'd ever want um, or uh, uh, ask around, ask someone that knows. That's always a good, good way to go too. So we've, we've kind of covered quite a bit. And so I just want to kind of summarize really quick and say, um, so we talked about this petition. 
this petition specifically says we want to clarify um, and kind of move that anti-restart requirement into somewhere that machine guarding people are going to see it. Um, and so, and uh, my initial conversations, right, this is going to be probably a 12 to 18 month process, but my initial conversations look like that is likely to happen. Um, and then secondly, was uh, that this kind of what I would call either mismarketing or mislabeling or misleading advertising that has led to these uh, kind of uh, these appliance controls being used is a um, is that um, Cal OSHA right does not regulate NRTLs, Fed OSHA does, and so there's going to be some some switching around. Um, I, I may file a formal complaint with the, the test labs. I'm still figuring out the best path for that one. Um, but I did want to just make sure that everyone's aware of that. Um, and then also you have the basics you need. And again, I'm going to share the presentation and the video um, to go out, test if your equipment is compliant with this one simple requirement, right? Um, will your machine restart after a power loss? That's one of those things you can test all your machinery for today. Um, and then if it does not comply, start chopping. Buy some stuff that'll um, that'll help you get those into compliance and um, and to um, keep moving forward. So what I'd like to do is right as we're summarizing, we're going to have a, a little Q and A. But um, I know since Make Safe is sponsoring this event, I just want to give you a quick look at um, what our, our products are. Just about a, a one minute video, um, and then we'll dive into Q and A. So I'm going to share this quick video with you all um, from right here in San Diego. My name is Scott Swaley and I'm the founder of Make Safe Tools. We're here at the NSC Expo in San Diego, California, and we're showing our Make Safe Tools power tool brake. So here it is installed on a one and a half horsepower bandsaw. So if you come on in, I'll show you some of its features. One, which is really interesting, is this device is actually just plug and play, meaning that we did not modify this bandsaw. We simply plugged the bandsaw into this device and this device into the wall. That now gives us this control panel down here which has an ANSI compliant emergency stop and a green start button. And this is our now um, how we control this bandsaw. And I'll show you some normal operation. We can now start the bandsaw. And um, what is really interesting is now when we stop it, we take a bandsaw that typically takes just, um, takes about 40 seconds to stop. And if we zoom in on the blade here, you're gonna see that when I press stop now, it actually comes to a complete stop in just one second making it much safer to operate, making it safe to reach for your uh, cutoffs once you complete an operation. Additionally, this provides a um, accidental restart prevention, meaning that if there's a loss of power, you will not have your tool come on and surprise you, which is an OSHA requirement. And lastly, as we mentioned before, you, you now have a ANSI compliant emergency stop button that you can position anywhere that it's convenient. And so with this added to a bandsaw or a branch grinder or a disc sander, you can make your shop safer without having to worry about installs, electricians, or anything like that. All right. So a um, couple just things for the eagle eyes out there. Someone might say, hey, there was a, an e-stop being used for a normal stopping. So yes, eagle eyes, we offer a, a lot of different control panels. Our standard one is actually a three button with a separate stop. Um, and um, I, I do see a question, so I'm going to um, knock over. Uh, obviously, we are a, a product company, but we are happy to answer any questions. I like doing this research. Um, it really kind of helps keep us informed, and it um, uh, helps us to help everyone else. So if you have specific questions, we are happy to kind of research with you and help however we can. So Dallas has a question. He says, how do you protect for restart on portable tools like handheld routers? So this is a tricky one. Um, and I was just talking um, or researching this recently. And the um, handheld tools are not covered by the anti-restart requirement I shared a second ago. They're actually one of the exclusions. But theoretically, the actual UL listing process for a particular portable tool may require it that way. Um, and often, um, I haven't read through all those standards in detail, so I'm, I'm using some contextual understanding here, um, is that uh, they can't be kind of easily or mistakenly activated. 
but that there isn't an explicit UL requirement that they have um, accidental restart installed. So um, what you could do is on those, you could get one of those um, uh, less expensive kind of inline plugs and literally it just plugs on the end and kind of dangles there with the cord. Um, you could even zip tie it on or something if you want to make sure people don't remove it. And so um, you, you would end up going through basically the exact same um, process, just probably looking for something that is more of an inline device just for convenience with those portable um, hand tools. Um, but also you can look for portable hand tools that have uh, momentary buttons. So if you, if you think about, let's say, a angle grinder, which are notoriously um, hazardous devices, um, there used to be a lot more angle grinders that had the locking um, on switches. They'd have a whole bar on the handle that you could lock in and on position, right? So then when you unplug it and plug it back in, it would turn on. So you will see some devices that have um, automatic releases um, where they will kind of automatically release that button when power is restored. And so that's more of like a, a shopping for the feature thing if you don't, if you can't find something that has it built in. So another anonymous attendee asked, um, are these things Cal OSHA or Fed OSHA requirements? So good question. So the um, petition I talked about was specifically about a Cal OSHA requirement, but Fed OSHA um, also has uh, accidental restart prevention language. And there's a few things to talk about here. One is the um, explicit mention of it in, um, in uh, what is it, 29 CFR, uh, 1910 and then the woodworking section for some reason the woodworking um, says specifically that anything that could create a hazard when restarting should have accidental restart prevention however um, i have seen it enforced outside of woodworking equipment um, often on some of these smaller machines and that's uh then we also kind of go back into the um the nfpa world right where we're talking about any motor that gets installed and you could argue that if you buy a bandsaw you're not installing a motor you're installing a saw and yeah there's some gray area um so uh i hope, hope that helps um, another question from dan hopwood uh, is the current configuration of your of your product i think it means ours like the one in the video can you inadvertently hit the start button after a normal stop or is the commercial version supplied a hood or recess for tech so i think uh, they're asking about like can you have a recessed start button? And so we have a variety of, um, of controls ranging from different uh, actual little control panels like that to uh, foot pedals and can do a lot of different ways. And so um, depending on the needs and the tool, um, we do it different ways. And so our, our new buttons are flush. And so they, they're, they're a little more protective of, the, um, of accidental presses. Cool. So if you have any other questions, or you've seen, or any, um, or any, anything else, go ahead and um, put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A. Um, and if you, um, if that's it, we wanna thank everyone for coming. We wanna thank the ASSP for organizing this event. Um, we will be sending out um, the, uh, the recording of the webinar as well as the, um, the PowerPoint to all registered attendees probably by the end of the day. Um, and if you have more questions, we're gonna we're gonna stick on here for a little bit more. And we see some people. Um, uh, Dallas awesome at the um, at a local company is saying that he uses our devices and loves them. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then uh, I see some other people talking about how the the cost can be um, hard for people, um, especially with lockout, tagout, and things like that. And the 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 th things I always say is I I understand that there's costs and. Um, what I find though is more in my research, and I mean, we've been working with NIOSH to do research on exactly these topics, is that it's often the difficulty of kind of intention and time to plan that's a bigger driver than cost for these little things. Like I was showing a, a $20 switch, right? You could put that on every tool in your facility for a couple hundred bucks. Um, and that only takes, you know, someone that's a little electrically competent, maybe 10 minutes a tool. Um, and so it's, it's often just kind of the, what I find, the mental space to kind of wrap our heads around it and say, okay, we are gonna do this one thing and we're gonna, you know, we're not maybe perfect yet, but we have a plan for over the next five years, we're gonna 
you know, this month we're going to look at accidental restart prevention. Great. We spent a couple hundred dollars, a couple days of someone's time. We've got those implemented. Okay. Next month we're going to be doing and evaluating for this. And you can roll that out piece by piece. Um, Cause I find the best way to start anything is to start, right? Even if it seems like a trivial start, it can make a really big difference. Um, I see a question from uh, Martin about uh, something about a valve shut off safety restart. So I think you're talking about um, other kinds of hazardous energy. And so we don't do that. There are um, a number of companies that kind of integrate uh, with more full service, but you, you really quickly get into having to do custom control panels because no two, um, no two situations are ever quite alike. So there's not a lot of commercially available things to do all of those. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and Al has a good point that, you know, we're talking about regulatory requirements, but in the end, it's, it's also that we're trying to keep people from getting hurt. And especially, like, when someone gets hurt, like, there are some, you know, crazy circumstances, right? We can't protect from everything, right? We never can. But when we see injuries happening that are so easily preventable, that's what ends up um, irking me personally. And so just thinking about, you know, like, what can we do that can make a difference? So um, I want to make sure that we respect everyone's time. Um, thank you again for attending. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to in this, my email is on the screen. Go ahead and uh, shoot me an email, give me a call, and we'd love to chat. So thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful day.